Hey everybody, this is Alicia Purdy with The Way of the Worshipper. Welcome to my channel. I'm reading the Bible through in one year. Today is day 50 of our one-year Bible reading plan. We have come a really long way. We still have a long way to go, but that's okay. I'm here for it, reading the Bible through in a year. I've been so blessed by this Bible reading plan with a little bit of the Old Testament, a little bit of the New Testament, a little bit of Psalms, and a little bit of a Proverbs. Just such a well-rounded and balanced perspective we get every day in God's word. It lets you see the cohesion of God's word. It shows you more clearly what God is trying to speak about the testimony of his son, Jesus, who's coming and being foreshadowed in the Old Testament. And we're watching his ministry unfold in the New Testament. What a powerful time it's been. Thank you for partnering with me, liking these videos. It's a big deal that you tap like. It's a big deal that you subscribe to the channel. It's a big deal when you leave a comment. And I'm so blessed that you're watching. And I love hearing what ministered to you? What did you like about today's reading? These are ways that you and I partner together in the gospel to advance it into the dark spaces of the world and shed God's light. So thank you for being part of that. I think it's a tiny but mighty movement in the kingdom of God. We are going to open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and the reading of your word. Lord, we mix our faith with your word. Father, we invite you into the places in our hearts, Lord, that we've we've had walls and we've had thorn bushes and fires all around, Lord, protecting us and keeping us safe. Lord, we want you to be the one that protects us and keeps us safe. So we open our hearts to you, Father. What is it that you would show us today? Lord, come and have your way. We partner with the reading of your word. We're advancing forward as the kingdom of God, learning and studying and growing and becoming stronger in our faith so that we can continue to not only advance the gospel, but maintain the territory you gave us when the enemy attacks. Thank you, Lord, for your help. Thank you for your power. You are worthy, the great king above all gods. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So before we get into the reading today, don't forget that I've linked below all kinds of resources you can print out, especially each day. I have a printable with reflection questions that are specific to our sections of reading as a resource to help your continued strengthening in the faith. I'm doing the same thing over here, just a sister in Christ reading the Bible through in a year. Okay, so our Old Testament reading today is in the book of Leviticus. Leviticus 728 to nine, six. When we last left off, we were looking at different types of offerings and seeing Jesus in all of it. The sin offering, the guilt offering, the blood, the body being broken. We see Jesus. We see Jesus. And the Lord says to his people, you're not to eat the fat and you're not to drink the blood because the world's pagan rituals were filled with bloodlust. Their gods always needed more blood and they were taking it from people. Their animals were holy to them. Their cows, that they weren't eating them. They weren't sacrificing them. They were sacrificing people. And so God is creating these distinguishing lines everywhere in all these tiny details about what it, between what it looks like in the world and what it looks like in the amongst the people of God. And so he tells him, you're not to drink any blood. You're not to eat the fat. And when you, when you have these entrails and all the dirty parts, you're to completely burn them. You're not to have anything to do with that part. And so God is showing his people what it looks like to be holy before we are seen as clean and cleansed and holy through Jesus Christ. So I see all this I see Jesus. Now we're moving into the section dealing with God's allotment for the people who serve in the ministry. The priests share. God, I've seen throughout this re these readings as the priesthood is being set up, how lovingly God has maintained always a portion and a share from what people brought into the tabernacle. He gave some every single time he gave some to the workers of the ministry as a pastor's daughter. That was very eye opening for me because you don't always see the greatest aspects of humanity in the church. And when you're a kid in the ministry and you see your parents struggle, it can breed resentment toward God. And I had to work through that and I had to struggle with that. And it was never God's fault. It was always people. And now I see here. That God, the pattern of sharing with the ministry, with your generosity and God creating a portion for the people who do the labor of the ministry, it is scriptural and God is establishing a foundation here by which he takes care of the priesthood. 
So we're in Leviticus 7, 28. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel, saying, he who offers the sacrifice of his peace offering to the Lord shall bring his sacrifice to the Lord from his peace offerings. His own hands shall bring the food offerings of the Lord made by fire, the fat with the breast, that the breast may be waved for a wave offering before the Lord. The priest shall burn the fat on the altar, but the breast shall be for Aaron and his sons. The right thigh you shall give to the priest for a contribution offering for the sacrifice of your peace offerings. The one among the sons of Aaron who offers the blood of the peace offerings and the fat shall have the right thigh for his portion. For the breast that is waved and the thigh that is contributed, I have taken from the children of Israel from the sacrifices of their peace offerings and have given them to Aaron the priest and to his sons as a perpetual portion from the children of Israel. This is the consecrated portion for Aaron and his sons from the food offerings of the Lord made by fire in the day when Moses presented them to minister as priests before the Lord, which the Lord commanded that they be given this in the day that he anointed them from the children of Israel as a perpetual portion throughout all their generations. If you've been watching these videos for a little while or started from the beginning, you'll note that I've been underlining every time I see an instance of the phrase to minister as priests to the Lord. One of the things I talk about in the book I wrote, The Way of the Worshiper, Connecting with the Spirit of God Through Restoring Intimacy, Purpose, and Understanding in Worship, addresses what it looks like in the Levitical priesthood, going through the book of Leviticus and all the statutes and the way that priests looked and the way that they behaved, noting what their exclusive purpose was, their original purpose, the foundational purpose of the Levitical priesthood was to minister as a priest to the Lord. And in the new covenant, you and I are that royal priesthood. That's 1 Peter 2, 9. But the statutes that we see about how to live a holy, righteous, and spiritually clean life, sanctified, we're transformed, but sanctified, which is a journey, is something that we see here in the book of Leviticus unfolding when God sets up this priesthood through the tribe of Levi. Remember the tribe of Levi was the ones when Moses said, who was on the Lord's side, come to me. When everybody was burning I and mean, worshiping and burning sacrifices and throwing off their gold to the golden calf, Moses drew a very hard line and only the tribe of Levi stood with Moses. So God considers them to be set apart from those who are set apart and even an additional layer of being set apart. So he's establishing the priesthood to minister as priests before the Lord. And that statute continues even today with you and I as the royal priesthood, the chosen generation. This is the law of the burnt offering of the grain offering and of the sin offering and of the guilt offering and of the ordinations and of the sacrifice of the peace offerings, which the Lord commanded Moses on Mount Sinai in the day he commanded the children of Israel to offer their offerings to the Lord in the wilderness of Sinai. Now we're in Leviticus chapter eight. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, take Aaron and his sons with them and the garments and the anointing oil and a bull for the sin offering and two rams and a basket of unleavened bread and gather all the congregation together at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him. And the assembly was gathered together at the entrance of the tent of the meeting. Moses said to the congregation, this is the thing which the Lord commanded to be done. Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water. Then he put a tunic on him and tied a sash around him and clothed him with the robe and put the ephod on him and he girded him with the decorative band of the ephod and bound the ephod to him. And he put the breastplate on him. He also put the urim and the thummim in the breastplate. Then he put the turban upon his head. Also on the turban at the front, he put the gold plate, the holy crown, as the Lord commanded Moses. Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was on it and sanctified them. He sprinkled oil on the altar seven times and anointed the altar and all of its vessels, both the laver and its stand to sanctify them. And he poured some of the anointing oil on the head of Aaron and anointed him to sanctify him. Moses brought the sons of Aaron and put tunics on them and girded them with sashes and put headbands on them as the Lord commanded Moses. He brought the bull for the sin offering and Aaron and 
and his sons laid their hands on the head of the bull for the sin offering. He slaughtered it, and Moses took the blood and put it on the horns of the altar around it with his finger and purified the altar and poured the blood at the base of the altar and sanctified it to make reconciliation on it. I'm going to stop for a second, and I'm going to get out my highlighter and write underline the word reconciliation. I see Jesus here, the blood and the reconciliation. He took all the fat that was on the entrails and the appendage above the liver and the two kidneys with their fat, and Moses burned them on the altar. But the bull and its hide, its flesh, and its refuse, he burned with fire outside the camp as the Lord commanded Moses. Then he brought the ram for the burnt offering, and Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of the ram. He killed it, and Moses sprinkled the blood on the sides of the altar. He cut the ram into pieces, and Moses burned the head, the pieces, and the fat. He washed the entrails and the legs in the water, and Moses burned the whole ram on the altar, and it was a burnt offering for a pleasing aroma and a food offering made by fire to the Lord as the Lord commanded Moses. Next, he brought the other ram, the ram of consecration. And Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of the ram. He slaughtered it, and Moses took some of its blood and put it on the tip of the right ear of Aaron and on the thumb of his right hand and on the big, big toe of his right foot. He brought the sons of Aaron, and Moses put some of the blood on the tips of their right ears and on the thumbs of their right hands and on the big toes of their right feet. Then Moses sprinkled the blood on the sides of the altar. He took the fat and the fatty tail and all the fat that was on the entrails and the appendage above the liver and the two kidneys and their fat and the right thigh. And out of the basket of unleavened bread that was before the Lord, he took one unleavened cake and a cake oil of oiled bread and one wafer and put them on the fat and on the right thigh. And he put all these into the hands of Aaron and into the hands of his sons and waved them for a wave offering before the Lord. Then Moses took them off their hands and burned them on the altar with the burnt offering. This was a consecration for a pleasing aroma, an offering made by fire to the Lord. Moses took the breast and waved it as a wave offering before the Lord. This part of the ram of consecration was for Moses, as the Lord commanded Moses. Then Moses took some of the anointing oil and some of the blood which was on the altar and sprinkled it on Aaron and on his garments and on his sons and on the garments of his sons with him and sanctified Aaron and his garments and his sons and the garments of his sons with him. Moses said to Aaron and to his sons, Boil the flesh at the tent of the meeting and eat it there with the bread that is in the basket of consecrations, just as I commanded, saying, Aaron and his sons shall eat it. That which remains of the flesh and of the bread, you shall burn up. You shall not go out of the door of the tent of the meeting for seven days until the days of your consecration are at an end, for your consecration will take seven days. As he had done this day, so the Lord commanded what is to be done as an atonement for you. Therefore, you shall abide at the entrance of the tent of meeting day and night for seven days and keep the charge of the Lord that you do not die. For so I have commanded. So Aaron and his sons did all the things which the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. Now we're in chapter nine. The priestly ministry begins. And it came to pass on the eighth day that Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. Then he said to Aaron to take a young calf for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering without blemish and offer them before the Lord. To the children of Israel, you shall speak, saying, Take a male goat for a sin offering, and a calf and a lamb, both a year old without blemish, for a burnt offering. Also, an ox and a ram for peace offerings to sacrifice before the Lord, and a grain offering mixed with oil. For today, the Lord will appear to you. They brought that which Moses commanded before the tent of the meeting, and the entire congregation drew near and stood before the Lord. Moses said, this is the thing which the Lord commanded that you should do. Then the glory of the Lord shall appear before you. That's the end of our reading in Leviticus today in the Old Testament, day 50 of reading the Bible through in a year. I'm going to underline this phrase down here. It really stood out to me, the word then. As a journalist, I'm constantly living in English and grammar and sentences and words. It's just something I naturally do anyway. And my eye tends to catch things like this. And then I mull them over for a really long time. It's just one of those things about me. But when he says here, this is the thing which the Lord commanded that you shall do. Then, and I'm going to circle that word. Then 
the glory of the Lord shall appear to you. So we just read a lot about consecration and sanctification because the book of Leviticus, the theme of Leviticus is holiness, the parameters, boundaries, and pathways to holiness. People can't be holy yet because Jesus Christ hadn't come. We're under the old covenant, but God in his mercy is creating a path to holiness for sinful people with the tabernacle and all the veils and all the layers and the consecration and all this rich symbolism of Jesus Christ coming and the the blood and the broken bodies and all the things that we see in the new covenant through Christ. What he's saying here is, then the glory of the Lord shall appear to you. We have access now through Jesus Christ. But here, what he's saying is that there is a process of sanctification They had to wash themselves. And the book of Ephesians talks about washing yourself with the water of the word. And so, as I was saying earlier, when we see this Levitical priesthood being set up, a lot of these principles are carried over. They're no longer laws, but they are spiritual principles that we as believers do follow. And the Bible says here, and the glory of the Lord shall appear to you. And that's my heart's desire. It's my heart's desire every day day. That is the end of our reading in the Old Testament. We're going to go over now to the New Testament reading in the book of Mark. Mark 3, 31 to 4, 25. When we last left off, Jesus had just told the Pharisees, how dare you blaspheme the Holy Spirit? It's not forgivable. And you run the risk, the danger, he says, of eternal condemnation. For they had said that Jesus was of Satan and Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. And he said, how dare you equate the power of God and the Holy Spirit to the filth and darkness of Beelzebub, of Satan. And so he really clamped down on them when he said that, because that is the ultimate blasphemy. He said, other blasphemies will be forgiven, but not that one. You do not equate anything regarding Satan with anything regarding the Holy Spirit. They're not even on the same, in the same universe. And so that was the admonishment there. People sometimes fret about the unforgivable sin. What does it mean to blaspheme the Holy Spirit? I, as a kid, that stuff scared the bejeebers out of me, but I now know and now understand that the unforgivable sin the, is the blas- the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Other blasphemies will be forgiven, but not that one. Satan is not the same as God. He's not omniscient. He's not all powerful. He's nothing like God. He's an imitator and a mocker, and he's a ripoff and a con artist and a liar. And Jesus was setting a clear boundary. Don't you dare say that that Satan Beelzebub is anything like the Holy Spirit, in case you were wondering. (laughs) Okay, here we go. Mark 331. Then his mother and his brothers came and standing outside, they sent to him, calling him. The crowd sat around him and said, your mother and your brothers are outside asking about you. And he answered, who are my mother and my brothers? Then he looked around at those who sat around him and said, here are my mother and and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. So in yesterday's reading, we saw that when he had entered a house and the crowd came together, they could, it was so crowded they couldn't eat bread, that his family heard of it and they went out to seize him. We saw yesterday and they said, he is beside himself. And now we're seeing in today's reading, he's kind of pushing back on them like, okay, they didn't understand. They were trying to seize him and saying, you're you're beside yourself. And Jesus had been, we saw in Matthew repeatedly, you're just Joseph's son. Aren't you, isn't your mother's name Mary? Wasn't your father the carpenter? People are constantly trying to minimize Jesus and diminish his power so that they don't have any responsibility to obey or to believe the gospel. And even in his own family, sometimes those are the hardest struggles that we have when Jesus said a prophet's not without honor in his own country. He was saying the same principle here, which is sometimes your family doesn't get it and you still got to move forward in Christ. Sometimes as Christians, we don't have family members that are believers. And Jesus is saying here, whoever does the will of God is my brother, my mother, my sister. He wasn't rejecting his family and I'm not implying that they weren't believers. What I'm saying is that at this point in time, They didn't understand fully with a completion 
what he was doing in the work of the ministry, what they saw was that he was being pressed in upon and maybe they were concerned about him and they were trying to rescue him from what was going on and being crushed in this house. But he didn't want that. He had a mission and he knew what it was. And so what he's saying here is those are my mother and my family. These are my family, the people who do the will of my father. So Mark 4, again, he began to teach by the seaside. A large crowd was gathered before him so that he entered a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole crowd was by the sea on the land. He taught them many things in parables and said to them in his teaching, listen and take note. A sower went out to sow and he sowed some seed that fell beside a path and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Some seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil and soon it sprang up because it did not have deep soil. But when the sun rose, it was scorched and because it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns and the thorns grew up and choked it and it yielded no grain. And other seed fell on good ground and it yielded grain that sprang up and increased by 30, 60 or a hundred times as much. Then he said to them, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. When he was alone, those who were around him with the 12 asked him about the parable. And he said to them, to you is given the secret of the kingdom of God, but to those who are outside, everything is said in parables, so that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. That's out of the book of Isaiah. Then he said to them, do not understand this parable. How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. These are those beside the path where the word is sown. But when they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word which was sown in their hearts. Others likewise are seed sown on rocky ground who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness, but have no root in themselves and so endure for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they fall away. And others are seeds sown among thorns, the ones who hear the word, but the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things entering in choke the word and it proves unfruitful. Still others are seeds sown on good ground and those who hear the word and receive it and bear fruit 30, 60 or a hundred times as much. He said to them, is a candle brought, bought to be put under a basket or under a bed and not to be set on a candlestick? For there is nothing hidden except to be revealed. Neither is anything kept secret except to be proclaimed. If anyone has ears, let him hear. He said to them, take heed what you hear. The measure you give will be measured for you. And to you who hear will more be given. For him who has will more be given. But from him who has not will be taken even what he has. The parable of the sower and the seeds is a very famous parable that lots of people understand. But Jesus said, they who have ears, let them hear. He means to hear with their heart. My dad is a pastor. And one of the things that he likes to say is that when the word comes, faith comes. Then the enemy comes to steal that word and to see if it's in your head or if it's in your heart. And so this is what's happening in the parable of the sower and the seed. When he says Satan comes immediately and takes away the word, which is sown in their hearts. This is why we want to be rooted and grounded in the word. Because the easiest way to destroy the mighty oak tree is to tear it from the ground when it is a young sapling. Satan knows that. Jesus knows that, and now he's telling us we must be rooted and grounded because hard times will come. When he says here, when persecution or affliction arises for the word's sake, the key word there is when. It is coming. In this world, you'll have tribulation. This is why we do things like dig into the word, study God's word, meditate on God's word, and read the Bible through in a year to hide God's word in our heart that we might not sin against God. That is the end of our New Testament reading. Let's go finish up the day with some Psalms and a proverb. Our reading in the Psalms today is Psalm 37, 12 through 29. I shared a really personal testimony yesterday about the struggle that I had when uh, someone tried to break into our house and it put a root of fear in me and I was really struggling. And while I was sleeping at night, I heard the words, I saw the words actually written in front of my eyes. 
do not fret because of evildoers. That's Psalm 31, 37, 1. And I got up the next day and I opened my Bible and I read that. And two additional times, three total, I saw in Psalm 37, do not fret, do not fret, do not fret because of the wicked, because of evildoers, because of those who do bad things. And I was so comforted by that current, relevant, quickened word that God gave me. And I've been holding on to that ever since and forcing myself into my faith to trust in the Lord and not give the enemy any airspace in my head where he can fly around and shoot at me. So Psalm 37, 12 through 29. I really like the Psalm. It's all marked up in my Bible. I read it over and over. And every single time I do, something else is quickened to me because God's word is living. It's alive through the Holy Spirit for just this way, just this reason. I love that about the Lord. The wicked plot against the righteous and grind their teeth against them. The Lord will laugh at him for he sees that his day is coming. The wicked have drawn out the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and the needy and to slay those on the upright path. Their sword will enter into their own heart and their bows will be broken. Better is a little that the righteous has than the abundance of many wicked for the arms of the wicked will be broken, but the Lord supports the righteous. The Lord knows the days of people of integrity and their inheritance will be forever. They will not be ashamed in the evil time and in the days of famine, they will be satisfied. But the wicked will perish and the enemies of the Lord will be like the glory of pastors. They will waste away in smoke. They will waste away. The wicked borrows and does not repay, but the righteous is gracious and gives. For those who are blessed of him will inherit the earth, but those who are cursed of him will be cut off. The steps of a man are made firm by the Lord. He delights in his way. Though he falls, he will not be hurled down, for the Lord supports him with his hand. I have been young, and now I'm old, and I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor their offspring begging bread. The righteous are gracious and lend. And their offspring are a source of blessing. Depart from evil and do good and abide forevermore. For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever, but the descendants of the wicked will be cut off. The righteous will inherit the land and dwell on it forever. Yes, and amen. The theme here we see in Psalm 37 is a contrast between what the path of the wicked will be and their outcome and what the path of the righteous is ordered by the Lord and the outcome. What a faithful God. I love how real the Psalms are. Always saying something, leaving us with hope in the Lord and showing us new aspects of God's character that we can take with us. I'm going to meditate on this one today. That is the end of our reading in Psalm 37. Now we're going to finish up with a proverb. Just a little nugget today, reading Proverbs 10, 5. He who gathers in summer is a wise son, but he who sleeps in harvest is a son who causes shame. We are going to be reading through the Proverbs in the Psalms twice this year in our one-year Bible reading plan, but that is the end of today's reading completely. Day 50 is done. Thank you for joining me today as I'm reading the Bible through in a year. I hope this reading has been a blessing to you. Thank you for tapping like on this video, supporting the advancement of the gospel online, subscribing to the channel, leaving a comment below. That's all ways that we partner together in getting more of the gospel online. Somebody somewhere is going to click on one of these videos and they're going to see something new about God. And I hope it ignites them to continue looking and continue digging. And then that word goes down in their heart and takes root. And when the enemy comes, he will not be able to pull them up all because we partnered together one day in the gospel in these little videos on YouTube. I think that is fantastic. It's so powerful. Do not minimize what a big act that is. I'm so grateful you were here today. I am Alicia Purdy from the way of the worshiper. Don't forget to check out the resources below. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your faithfulness and your living, active, powerful word. 
Lord, that is sharper than any two-edged sword. Thank you, Lord, that the path of the righteous are established by the Lord. We delight in your way, O oh Lord. We thank you, Father, that we can see over and over and over again your covering, your hand of mercy, your victorious, righteous right arm, Lord, that you rescue. You see what we're going through. You see the troubled times and you make a way. Father, you are good. We, we safely put our trust in you. Father, we will not fret because of evildoers because we have seen their end. Father, we put our hope in you and our times are in your hand. You are worthy. You are worthy above. You are the great king above all gods. All blessing belongs to you, Lord, the faithful God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow, everybody. Bye-bye.